version of Palm Sunday in Matthew's Gospel. You'll find it in chapter 21 and it's the first 11 verses. Begins. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fold of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The King's Procession. Next month, we will experience a procession, a King's Procession, to and from a coronation in Westminster Abbey. The last time that was done was over 70 years ago. So it will be something quite unique for most of us in this room. I don't know what you think about the country at this moment in time, but the one thing we do seem to do quite well is pomp and ceremony. You only have to go to London and see the tourists and you know we do it quite well. <laughs> And it probably brings in a lot of money to the economy as well. But you know, I don't know about you, but I love processions. And when I was working in Staffordshire, the local authority that I worked for, we had one of the biggest bases, military bases in the country, MOD Stafford. It was home to two regiments and also the tactical wing of the RAF. They're the people that drop supplies behind enemy lines for our special forces that are operating covert operations. So therefore, every year, my chief exec used to say to me, you're my church man, you can go with the mayor, and you can go to Remembrance Sunday, and you can go to Battle of Britain Sunday. So I had to attend every year with the mayor, two processions. And I used to stand on the dais just behind him while he did his salute in all his robes and everything, and all the troops and the bands and everything would march past. And it was great, particularly if it wasn't raining. It was great. It was a fantastic sight to see. Although the church service left a bit to be desired, but never mind, that's another story. Never once did I mention in all the years that I did this with the mayor that I was the son of a German. That wouldn't have gone down well, would it? 
Uh, no, and I got on very well with the Brigadier, so there we go. <laughs> Let's cast our minds back 2,000 years. It's the city of Jerusalem. And they, the, the people can't believe what they see in one week. Because there is, is it stuck? No, it's there. There were two processions into Jerusalem in a week. That was amazing. The first procession was all pomp and ceremony. It was Pilate, the Roman governor, and the magistrate general coming from his palace in Caesarea on the coast, which was the Roman city, traveling 55 miles with all his soldiers and whatever he brought with him in his fancy chariot and whatnot, rising two and a half thousand feet into Jerusalem. He came to be seen at the most important religious festival in his province. He wanted to be seen. He wanted to be acknowledged for his position. And as he entered his halls of residence in the Jewish capital, laurel leaves would be spread before him because he represented the conquering force. And in Roman times, that was represented by laurel leaves. That was the first procession. We're not quite sure which day it happened, but it happened because he was there at the feast. And then there was the second procession. Instead of coming in from the east, from the west of the city, this procession came in from the east. Instead of 55 miles, it was two miles. Instead of rising two and a half thousand feet, it descended 200 feet. It came in through a garden called the Mount of Olives because olives constituted a garden in those days. No fancy chariot, no golden coach and horses, no detachment of soldiers, but a carpenter riding on a donkey, receiving the praise of his people. No laurel leaves, but instead, and it, we only read of it in John's Gospel, it's not in the other Gospels, people cut down palm leaves and spread them before Jesus, riding on a donkey. Can you imagine two processions that contrasted so greatly? Amazing. One compared to the other. And the centre of attention, the person in the, that had, if you like, the focus in both processions, they were going to cross that route in a most significant way. One knew it, and the other didn't. Pilate couldn't have imagined that he was going to try Jesus, but Jesus knew as he came into that city. And of the two, which had the authority? Which was the true king? Which was the true sovereign? Who was actually ruling? Well, we know it was Jesus of the two. Why? Let me mention four things. The first one is this. Don't think that Jesus coming in to Jerusalem was a mistake, that he should have kept away and then it had been safe. Don't think that all the things that happened to him were, in quotes, very unfortunate. Don't think that that death was, well, he never saw it coming, because he did. It was foretold. Jesus fulfilled the scriptures. Even in the passage I've read to you, the scriptures were fulfilled. The prophecies of Zechariah, Isaiah, and the psalmists are all referred to in that passage that I uh, read to you earlier on. For my devotions this morning, I read Psalm 118. Great time to read on Palm Sunday because 
it's all about the triumphant entry into Jerusalem by Jesus in the Psalms. And you know what? Jesus is still fulfilling scripture and there are scriptures still to be fulfilled. So he's not just a temporary ruler like Pilate was, he's an everlasting ruler. And I look forward to the scriptures that Jesus fulfills concerning me and you about the future and about eternity and reigning with him. Jesus is the true king because he fulfilled the scriptures. But not only that, he was the creator and sustainer of his kingdom. Pilate never put together the Roman Empire. It was done for him. But Jesus had created his kingdom. Listen to what Paul says to the Colossians. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. For a hobby, I build model railway engines. Now that's sad, I know, but I've got this Welsh narrow gauge engine here. It's made out of white metal. I got the parts. I soldered them together. And I ran solder in all the gaps. And I put all the brass parts on it. And then I spray painted it to get a consistency. And then I lined it. I put transfers on. I put the motor in it. Run beautifully. Runs beautifully. But I didn't make it. I didn't make it. I assembled it. See, the white metal parts were already there. My soldering iron was already there. My paint was already there in my, air, in my spraying gun. The transfers I bought, the brass parts I bought were already made. All I did was assemble it. When Jesus, the creator, the word, and God said, let there be, he didn't take parts. He actually made the parts. When he said, let there be light, it wasn't as though there were bits of light all over the place and he brought them together. He created. When he said, let there be water and let there be fish in the water, he didn't bring the, the constituent bits of water together, the chemical bits of water together. He created them in the first place. He didn't assemble creation. He created creation. And that's the difference. And as he rode into Jerusalem, and as he wept for that city, he realized that that week, he wasn't just... He wasn't just the creator. He was going to have to sustain his creation and he was going to have to become the redeemer of that creation and the redeemer of you and I today. He is the creator and the sustainer of his kingdom. Why? Why do you have to redeem? Because of the next thing that makes him the greatest king. And that is is the compassionate king. Let me tell you about Pilate. We know quite a lot about Pilate because Roman records are quite methodical. Pilate was a nasty piece of work. He really was a nasty piece of work. You work with people like that, I have. Real nasty piece of work he was. He was known for his cruelty. Even in this week, he would wash his hands of an innocent man and 
condemning to death. And you would have thought that as the chief judge in the land, as the Roman governor, he'd have made sure justice was done. He wasn't. Do you know what happened to Pilate? He got the sack. The Roman Empire was one of the cruelest empires in history, and they sacked him. They were that appalled with his cruelty. He put down a rebellion by killing residents across a huge area, and even the cruel Roman Empire was that annoyed and that <clears throat> at Pilate that they sacked him. In fact, they didn't allow him back in Rome. He was banished from going back to Rome. He retired to the south of France. That sounds pretty good to me, but yeah, he, he wasn't allowed to go to Rome. He had to go to the south of France. And the records tell us he became depressed and he committed suicide. He wasn't an everlasting ruler by any stretch of the imagination, was he? But not with Jesus. Jesus shows compassion. All through the Gospels, Jesus was there for people. Most of us in this room, in fact, I hope all of us in this room, can say we've experienced the compassion, the grace, the love, the care, the concern of Jesus. And if you haven't, I'd love to speak to you afterwards. I really will. So I've got a challenge for you. If Jesus is the compassionate king, what are you and I going to do about it this week? Because how does Jesus show his compassion to his creation today? As a Pentecostal church, we believe that with the power of the Holy Spirit, we are the hands, the feet, the voice of Jesus, wherever we are. We're ambassadors for Jesus. How are you and I going to show compassion, the compassion of the everlasting King, this week? Can you think of someone right now or during the day, someone that you can show in a special way compassion to Jesus? And as you go through the week, whether you're at work or in the neighbourhood or at school or at college or at university, wherever you are, are, are you and I sensitive enough for Jesus to prompt us to say, go speak with that person. Go do that. And they'll feel the love and compassion of Jesus. I prepared this talk by doing my usual trick. I got up dead early yesterday morning, bombed up the M6. Don't get fed up with these long stretches of 50 mile an hour. I got up the M6, I got as far as Junction 40, the Penrith turn, and I turned into the northern ranks. 40 minutes later, I was on the fires. Cloud cover, I mean, you were above the cloud. I was in the cloud. Cloud cover was at about 2,000 feet. And I was walking towards a mountain called Great Gable. Has anyone here climbed Great Gable? Good man. Good man. Great Gable's not the tallest mountain in the Lake District, is it, Paul? It's not. It's only about 2,850 feet. But it's the biggest mass. So it dictates the weather. The wind comes off the Irish Sea, comes up the Ravendale Valley, hits Great Gable, and Great Gable splits it. So Great Gable was in front of me. It was in the cloud. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it on my face. That's how you and I are during the week. Do people feel Jesus through us? Do they see him? Do they receive his compassion, his grace? Do they receive his attention through you and I? 
we serve a compassionate king. We have a challenge each week. And then the other thing that I was going to mention was that Jesus is the everlasting king. You see, on Palm Sunday, it talks about palm leaves being put down before him. But let me read another passage that's got palm leaves in it. It's from Revelation. After this, I looked. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe and people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches. And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You know, on that Palm Sunday, those palm branches were the temple. They were in the frame of time, weren't they? It's history, yeah? So they weren't timeless. It was a there and now. Because We know that because many people shouted Hosanna, a few days later, we'd be shouting, crucify him. So it was all in a time frame. But you know, one day, our worship won't be in a time frame. It will be in eternity. It will be in eternity. And Jesus won't be sitting on a donkey. He'll be sitting on a throne. And he'll be acknowledged. And even Pilate... Even he will have to come before Jesus and this time not wash his hands, that will be me. And he'll have no option. But we, hopefully, will bow the knee gladly because we've experienced his grace. So here's my final challenge this morning. And that is this. This morning, how heartfelt is your Hosanna? How heartfelt? You think of that crowd 2,000 years ago. Some, they just went with the crowd. I mean, if you've been in a football crowd, you know, like, you go to Wembley and it's, you know, 85,000 there and people stop. And, and you're with it. You're with the crowd. You, you, you're going for it. You know, you, you're over the top. Or you, you go to a gig and, you know, you're really enjoying the music. And you go, oh, you, you're over the top. And you think, did I really do that? You know? And these people on Palm Sunday, some of them were like that. And there are some people that, that, that through time, going all the way through to when eternity begins, whenever that is. We know it will begin, but we don't know whether it will end. It's not going to end, is it? Um, you know, um, you know, how heartfelt is your Hosanna? Is it for a fleeting moment, going with the crowd? Oh, Joe Green, I love this church. And yeah, we... we We've got, we've got some good bands. We've got some, you know, bands and, and everything. But, but how heartfelt is it your Hosanna today? Does your praise come from your mouth? Or does it come from your heart? Your mind? Your soul? Your very being? Because that's what Jesus wants. He died for that privilege. We should give him that privilege of our heartfelt Hosannas. So let's remember that as we go to Easter, and as we no doubt read in our Bibles about him, that Jesus is the King of Kings, the everlasting one, the rightful King. And let's make sure that we are truly his ambassadors this week. And in our staff, we've definitely got a right kind of Osama. Is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to
Thank you. 